welcome to the 17th episode of Rontro, Class of Retro. everyone and welcome to another episode. I just want to start off by letting you all know that my live streaming on Twitch is on hold for now and I also will not be releasing videos as fast as I was before. I've gotten some new responsibilities to take care of so my time is a bit limited at the moment. I want to at least bring you two to three reviews a month for the time being. With that, let's get on with the review. Today we will be reviewing The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask for the Nintendo 64. The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask was developed and published by Nintendo and was released April 27, 2000 in Japan, October 26, 2000 in North America, and a PAL version was released on November 17, 2000. This is an action-adventure game produced by Shigeru Miyamoto. This game sold around 314,000 copies in just the first week in Japan. Three million copies were sold worldwide. Majora's Mask was also released for the Nintendo GameCube as part of the Legend of Zelda Collector's Edition in 2003, on the Wii Virtual Console in 2009, and an enhanced remake was released on the Nintendo 3DS under the name The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask 3D in February of 2015. Majora's Mask is the sixth main installment in the series and is the second to use 3D graphics, the first being its predecessor, Ocarina of Time. This is considered to be one of the darker titles in the series by critics. The gameplay for Majora's Mask expands on Ocarina of Time and retains the concept of dungeon puzzles and songs played with the Ocarina. This game introduces character transformations and a three-day cycle. Link can perform his basic actions like walking, running, and limited jumping while using items to battle his enemies and solve puzzles. Link's main weapon, as always, is a sword and it can be upgraded throughout the game. Link can block or reflect attacks with his shield as well, and there are many weapons and items throughout the game that allow Link to do a variety of things. Some of these items being masks, which are a central part of the game. Link can transform into different creatures like a Deku Scrub, a Goron, and a Zora all by putting on a mask, and each of these forms has unique abilities. As the Deku Scrub, Link can perform a spin attack, shoot bubbles, skip across water, and fly for a short time by using a Deku Flower. As a Goron, Link can roll at high speeds and with enough speed, spikes will protrude from his body. He can also punch with deadly force, stomp the ground with his rock-like body, walk through lava without taking damage, and weigh down heavy switches. And lastly, as a Zora, Link can swim at high speeds, throw his fins like a boomerang, generate a force field, and walk on the bottoms of bodies of water. There are many areas that can't be accessed without the assistance of these abilities. There are many other masks in the game as well, but they do not transform Link. They do, however, have their own uses. Majora's Mask has a set time limit of 3 days game time, which is around 54 minutes real time. Link can, however, return to 6 a.m. of the first day by playing the Song of Time. When this is done, the player loses all minor items, keys, cleared puzzles, and rupees that haven't been deposited into the bank. If Link doesn't finish his quest before those 72 hours are up, the moon that hangs ominously in the air will crash into the clock town, destroying it and all surrounding regions of Termina. We'll talk a little bit more about this in the plot. Let's move on to the plot. 
Majira's Mask takes place several months after Ocarina of Time. Link starts the search of a dear lost friend. In the beginning cutscene we can see that he is without his fairy, so he must be looking for Navi. Why he would with how annoying she is, is beyond me. While Link was riding Epona through a forest in Hyrule, he got ambushed by the masked Skull Kid and his fairy friends Tattle and Tail. The trio steal both Epona and the Ocarina of Time. Link runs after them down a dark cave, and once Link catches up to the Skull Kid, he curses Link by turning him into a Deku Scrub. Tattle stops Link from pursuing the Skull Kid as him and Tail escape. Realizing that she has been separated from her brother, Tattle insists that Link work together with her. As Link begins pursuing the Skull Kid once again, he finds himself inside the Clock Tower in the land of Termina. It is there where Link finds himself face to face with the creepy, happy mask salesman. The salesman offers to help Link remove his curse in exchange for what he must regain, the first being the Ocarina of Time and the second being Majora's Mask. The Skull Kid had stole the mask from the Happy Mask Salesman, and when he placed it on his face, the Skull Kid was possessed by its overwhelming power. It transformed him into an uncontrollable fiend who enjoys causing others misfortune. The worst of these is the impending apocalypse brought on by the moon, which is on a collision course with the clock tower. In three days, Termina would be no more. After returning to the Salesman after obtaining the ocarina, he teaches Link the Song of Healing, and the curse is lifted, leaving behind a Deku Scrub mask. When the Salesman realizes that Link has not retrieved the mask, he insists that Link pursue the Skull Kid once again. From here, Link must visit four dungeons and beat their bosses to release four giants, each taken over by a curse of their own thanks to masks. Without these giants' help, Termina will be doomed for sure. I want to take a minute and talk about a running theory that many have talked about. Keep in mind it is only a theory and none of it has been confirmed by Nintendo. The one theory on this game is that Link died in his search of Navi. Through his quest in this parallel land to Hyrule, Link works his way to the acceptance of his death. I believe that this theory is very possible. He does fall down a pretty deep hole and I find it hard to believe that Link could survive it. I also find it crazy that every NPC bears a resemblance to one from the previous game. Could our hero, the hero of time, be truly dead? I think it could be very possible. I want to talk about this game's development a little bit. Following the release of Link's Awakening for the Game Boy in 1993, we had to wait five years for the Ocarina of Time, which took four years to develop. Nintendo didn't want fans to have to wait again for so long, so they reused Ocarina of Time's game engine and graphics. It took a smaller team to create it, and it only took a year. According to director E.G. Anuma, they were faced with the very difficult question of just what kind of game could follow Ocarina of Time in its worldwide sales of 7 million units. This is when the idea of the three-day system, thought up by Shigeru Miyamoto and Yoshi Akai Kazumi, came to fruition. This allowed the developers to make the game data more compact while still providing deep gameplay. Miyamoto and Kazumi also came up with the story that served as the basis for the script written by Mitsuhiro Takano. It is thought that Majora's Mask was originally planned for the 64DD, a magnetic disk drive peripheral for the Nintendo 64. As Majora's Mask runs on an upgraded version of the engine that was used in Ocarina of Time, it required the use of the 4 megabyte expansion pack. One theory suggests that due to Majora's Mask's possible origin as a Nintendo 64 DD game, it would require an extra 4 megabytes of RAM. This expanded draw distance, which allows players to see much further and eliminates the need for the fog effect. The music in this game is phenomenal, which is really no surprise as all Zelda games have a stupendous soundtrack. Koji Kondo returns to lend his expertise to this soundtrack alongside Toru Minigishi, who did three of the battle tracks. Majora's Mask largely consists of reworked music from Ocarina of Time as well as other traditional Zelda music such as the Overworld theme, along with some new material. Kondo describes the soundtrack as having an exotic Chinese opera sound. As you progress through the three-day cycle, you may notice that the music varies in the clock town from day to day, getting progressively faster, giving a sense of urgency.
As for the reception, approximately 3.36 million copies were sold worldwide and around 314,000 copies were sold just in the first week in Japan alone. Like its predecessor, the game garnered universal acclaim. It is often regarded as the darkest and most original game in the Legend of Zelda series. Opinions were favorable regarding how the game compares to its predecessor, Ocarina of Time, which is often cited as one of the greatest video games of all time. However, a common criticism of Majora's Mask is that it is not as accessible as Ocarina of Time. On December 24, 2010, this game was voted as the game of the decade by Game FAQs, beating out Super Smash Bros. Brawl. So there are actually a couple stories I'd like to share with you from the year 2000. During this game's release, I remember going to Walmart with my father and seeing employees walking around the store with different paperboard masks, each looking like either a Zora, Goron, or Majora's Mask. This got me pumped for the game. The game's October 26th release was just a couple weeks after my birthday, so I missed out on it being one of my gifts. Got me pumped for Christmas, though, that year, as I hoped that I would find this game neatly wrapped under my tree. Sure enough, Christmas morning came, and Majora's Mask was right there just waiting for me to pop it into my Nintendo 64. As for my other memory, a friend of mine named Ray had come over to stay at my house one night, and I was playing Majora's Mask as he watched. I got to the part where you were carrying a hunk of meat down the mountain, and I had slipped off one of the cliffs, dropping said hunk of meat. Keep in mind, it was very late at night, and sleep deprivation probably played a huge part in this. I looked at Ray and said to him with a serious look on my face, I dropped my meat. Silence fell on the rim for about three seconds before we both started laughing uncontrollably for about 15 minutes. I'm sure my father didn't appreciate this as he was already in bed for the night, but Ray and I had a fun time that night and got a good laugh out of it. We still talk years later and every so often one of us will just say, I dropped my meat and we'll chuckle at the memory from that night. If I had to rate this game, I would give it a solid 10 out of 10 for its originality, awesome gameplay, and great soundtrack. If you've never played Majora's Mask before, I highly suggest finding yourself a copy for one of the multiple platforms it's on. This does it for the review. You can now find me on social media, and the links are in the description below. Make sure to hit that subscribe button, and please share your memories from this game in the comment section below, along with any comments, questions, suggestions, or requests. Stay tuned after the credits for a quick tip and the reveal of the final game for this year's Summer of Retro. This has been your host, Rontro, and I'll see you next time on The Class of Retro. Here's a quick tip. Running out of time in that three-day cycle and don't want to lose your hard-earned rupees? Then make sure you place your rupees in the bank before you play your ocarina to go back in time. So here we go everyone, we have our next and final Summer of Retro Hall of Game inductee for this year. Here we go. It's the Revenge of Shinobi for the Sega Genesis and Mega Drive. So there you have it everyone, all four of our Summer of Retro games. Super Mario Bros. 3, Act Razor, Metal Gear Solid, and the Revenge of Shinobi. See you next time.